Hello, hello, Transmediale. I wanted to thank you so much for giving us a break before we start this panel because it was so tropically warm in here. And after uh, you know, a winter with austerity-driven, non-heated rooms in the art school in Basel where I work, um, I, I just couldn't stand it. So I'm really happy that it got a bit colder. Thank you also for inviting me uh, to moderate this panel today. I am Johannes Bruder. I am the head of the Critical Media Lab at the Academy of Art and Design in Basel. And I am having a conversation around um, scale, uh, around micro, miso, macro, today with three wonderful artist researchers, Asia Basturieva to my right, Dennis Dison here, and Nadim Chufi, who you've already seen uh, in performance lectures during the festival. I wanted to give you a short heads up on the panel structure. I'm going to give uh, maybe a bit lengthy intro, excuse me. Uh, then we will have one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversations uh, with each participant, including a roughly 10-minute presentation. And then afterwards, questions by me uh, for each one. And then we're going to have an open conversation uh, with questions from the audience, if you like. Um, we will take up the theme of this year's Transmediale model map and fiction, basically, or primarily through engaging with imaginaries <coughs> and fantasies that materialize through dams and urban greening projects and geoengineering experiments, uh, large-scale energy infrastructure, or green or low-carbon extraction projects that are now mushrooming all over Europe, at least potentially. Um, some of these infrastructures have been or are built. Uh, others are merely projected and meta, if you will, but they all have in common that they are at the same time fantastic and very material, right? Um, for even more uh, mere projections, do structure lived realities, they do affect bodies, and they do transform land. And these trend material effects um, are often consumed by the fantasies and the imaginaries of transition and transformation that we effectively react to. So I wanted to bring in the term energy unconscious, which has been uh, coined by literature scholar Patricia Yeager, um, and then taken up by anthropologists like Viva Swansoni, Dominic Boyer, and Imre Seyman. Um, to describe the strange presence and absence uh, of energy in the lives of, in this case, mainly North Americans, despite the fact that it is saturated into every aspect of social substance. Um, they write, our everyday practices and activities have been shaped by energy in a way that we have never fully understood. Um, anyone interested in understanding the material, social, and symbolic operations of an issue as important as, in brackets, for instance, um, human freedoms must take into account the significance of energy in enabling the very possibility of these freedoms, and must certainly do so if they want to grapple with their continuation or extension in an era of environmental challenges and diminishing energy resources. But this book is from 2017. The global situation isn't completely different, but from a European and German perspective, and I'm German, I wanted to say, Energy has become way more conscious for sure, and I would like to uh, uh, please bring up the energy dashboard. Great. Um, so this is something you see on the uh, newspaper uh, website of the Fa Fa Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung, FATS, every day now. Um, it kind of creates a consciousness of energy uh, from a very German standpoint, of course. So it's becoming conscious of energy and crisis through the dashboard. And the element that I wanted to point to particularly is the Gasspeicherfüllstand. So um, how full are German gas tanks, right? It's probably something uh, that wasn't in anybody's... Like, nobody looked at these gas tanks really, I think, in the public um, for the last years. Um, but it, was, it got really, really important. And like over the fall, the talk in the German newspapers was all, all around the, you know, if these gas tanks are going to be full, till the winter, or if everyone would have to freeze. So these visualizations, they introduce scalar epistemology, um, to use a term coined by geographer Catherine T. Jones. Uh, they create a national energy consciousness in a way, right? It's real-time information that determines the scale of politics and creates an enormous potential for effective politics. And um, the geographer John Harley has written in 1992 that these images, they... they um, are mutually reinforcing um, this, the rules of society and the rules of measurement uh, in the same way. 
Dennis will tell us a bit more about these kind of affective responses that measurements and images create later, and how playing with affective responses can be ta a tactics of queer survival. Despite the becoming conscious of energy through the dashboard, though, the energy unconscious persists. Um, it is a complex phenomenon, for it describes invisibilities or the absence of feeling for something that is literally everywhere at all at once, hidden in plain sight. Similar things have been said about infrastructure, as you probably know. So, infrastructures become visible upon breakdown. Susan Lee Stark, infirms quip in the ethnography of infrastructure. Or the invisibility of infrastructure breaks <clears throat> when it fades away. The idea that infrastructure is typically uh, invisible has been critiqued, for infrastructure, of course, can be also hyper-visible and fetishized, embodying the power to effect and affect, uh, even if they haven't been built yet. And that's the topic that Nadim took up in his lecture performance on Wednesday night, uh, the opening night. Um, he was talking about theme parks of sustainability, if you will, and we will hear more about that later too. Yet what Starr was interested in also are the processes in politics of infrastructuralization. Um, when things and people or entire regions or countries are fading away, out of public consciousness, seemingly, seemingly receding into an opaque background, becoming infrastructure. What is infrastructuralized, even if highly visible, tends to wane, and in the movement of green transitions, governments create green sacrifice zones that manifest ambition, yet quickly come in and out of public consciousness, determining, uh, de dependent on how important they are considered for the dashboard. We will hear more about this becoming infrastructure, becoming material, and becoming resource from Asia over the course of our conversations. All our panelists' research speaks volumes about inhabiting <clears throat> the material infrastructures, effects and affects of imaginaries and fantasies, courtesy of the perceived center wherever it is currently. Their work problematizes or breaks prescriptive op operations of scaling through alternative ways of rendering through media that affect differently. Dennis. You're a research-based artist and writer, currently based in Barcelona. Um, you were born and raised in the Philippines until moving to the US in the late 90s, eventually continuing your studies in the US and UK. And in your practice, you engage with the intersections of technology and ecology, and the resulting often ungraspable techno-ecologics through dissonance, irony, and the absurd. Thanks. <laughs> For instance, some of the research work frames various <clears throat> climate intervention proposals, like um, solar radiation management, for instance. So when the sun is dimmed to mitigate the effects of global heating, the atmosphere becomes a topological space. Um, and in your research performance yesterday, you took up the phenomenon of volcanic winters based on the eruption of Mount Pinatubo in 1991 in the Philippines, which reduced the Earth's surface temperature by about 0.6 degrees Celsius for the following two years. And the interesting thing is that current geoengineering experiments um, are rooted in the observed effects of the eruption and thus conflate nature and ecology in weird ways, right? So, and I would ask you to talk us through this performance a bit and the research that undergirds it and your personal memories of the volcano that play a role in the, in the performance. Yeah, thank you, Johannes. Can you hear me? Am I on? <laughs> For somebody? <laughs> Hello, here we go. There you go. Hi, can you hear me? You can hear me. Oh, okay, cool. Um, yeah, thank you, Johannes. Um, so, the performance yesterday is part of a long term um, research project uh, called Too Cool to Burn, which I started a few years ago. Um, and it reimagines climate sensitivity um, in other forms. And formally, climate sensitivity is a, a climate science equation that measures how much the Earth, um, how much the Earth will warm based on increasing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it's sort of a macro scalar form of measuring uncertainty, though maybe even more paradoxically, it's giving, um, giving certainty to uncertainty. So, Sumpong, the um, 
Yeah, the slides up. Uh, so it, this is just um, an excerpt of one of the poems um, that I've written for this research performance. It combines performance poetry with sound and music. Uh, it sort of consolidates intersecting research that centers around Mount Pinatubo, which, as Johanna said, um, erupted in the Philippines in 1991. And the series of poems has sort of written and performed um, plays with the incoherence of encounter, um, en encountering either scientific information or the absurd or uh, the absurd in techno science. And in part, it also sort of speculates the position of the volcano. But in reading, in reading geoengineering and climate, climate intervention strategies, Pinatuba is most often always referenced in solar radiation management and um, or stratosphere, SAI, stratospheric aerosol injections more specifically, as a model for generating an artificial volcanic winter to cool the surface of the Earth. And this was the case of that the scale of that particular eruption combined with subsequent weather events and patterns, which reduced the, um, the global surface temperature by about 0 0.6 degrees in Celsius. Um, but I guess my memory of Pinatubo is somewhat in proximity to this research in varying degrees. Um, my dad uh, grew, was born in, and raised in Pampanga, which is one of the regions nearby. So we would visit this, um, this vol this, his hometown often, but this volcano sort of, prior to the eruption, sort of just existed as a thing from a distance. You know? So when the eruption started um, and gradually became bigger, we lived in, uh, in the city at the time, which is about 100 kilometers away. Ashfall began to increase and sort of started to pile up. Mounts of ashfall started to pile up. And visually, you can imagine this in a tropical climate. It was like blankets of matte snow. Um, and texturally, though, I remember it being quite grainy. So I knew what was happening, but was quite confused as to why it was happening. I just remember being told that there was value in keeping the ash. So little old excited me. Um, I had plastic spoons and sort of empty mason jars in hand, um, scooping up this volcanic debris for taking and keeping as a collectible. Um, so the next photo, the, um, I wanted to show this photo, which is, um, this was, this was two, about two years after the eruption. Um, and it was resurfaced by some family members on Facebook. Uh, and as you can see, I mean, you can see the, the, the roof of an elementary school in the background, what was an elementary school in the background, which was buried under Laharo volcanic mud flow. Um, and that's me on the far right. Those are some visiting family members. And needless to say, my parents were not surprised when I came out of the closet. Um, so, <laughs> sorry, that was just an aside. Hi, hi Mom, I, you might be watching. Um, <laughs> so, but the thing is, that I have no recollection of this photo being taken um, whatsoever. So in sort of new light, I look at the photo and sort of have this curiosity to, to, um, to return. Uh, but the research itself, I think, having started as, um, starting, start, having started on technophysics, techno fixes and solutions um, has really evolved from what was very scientifically focused to something that has become a little bit more personal for me. And I think, you know, I speak from the experience of a person who's part of the Philippine diaspora, who's lived and now live in um, both imperial and colonial powers that once occupied it. So as a way of sort of reconnecting um, unlearning and re-encountering. There, like there were a few things that I wanted to conjure up in this performance. The first thing is that uh, the peripheral stories and adjacencies that might have been forgotten or ignored. Um, evacuation efforts seemingly helped in minimizing fatalities, but there's obvious devastation from, from the eruption. You know, so there were deaths during and after the eruption displacements um, and eventual destruction caused by the, by, by the lahar that still happened to this day when there's, when there's heavy rain. And one community in particular that was displaced from their ancestral domain are the Pinatubo Aita, who inhabited the, um, the, the forested areas surrounding the volcano. And also, who by the way, also were the ones who were on the ground 
and notified FIVOLX, which is the Volcanology Institute in the Philippines, about um, early rumblings and early warnings from the volcano before it actually erupted. And Pinatubo is, um, is a sacred place for the Aita. They believe that their deity, Apuna Moyari, lives inside the volcano and was angered by early geothermal explorations and drillings. Um, and consequently, this anger basically is what, what, what caused the eruption. But I think in, in, I guess in this context, you know, in Western academic um, ecological discourse, there's sort of an advocacy for empathy uh, with other or toward the more than human. And I wonder what it would be to perceptively go further, um, to get weird, um, to get, as in the performance yesterday, get awkward. Um, get, get lost in a deep feeling or heavy or dissonant affective attachments that don't necessarily fall within the binary of positive or negative. Uh, and I think maybe pain and anger could be motivation for an activism, for example, but I wonder what it would be like to inhabit confusion and fear, uh, queer shame or even pleasure, um, confusing feelings that might be attached to loss, grief, uh, and devastation, and then having the notion, having sumpong, the concept of sumpong, of sumpong or temporary psychic withdrawals as entry and exit points into other forms, other positionalities, other forms of relationalities, and, and maybe intelligibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I absolutely loved your performance yesterday. <clears throat> and I was also taken by something or a comment you made, and I think. You told me that everybody asks you about that, but I'm going to do it again. Um, there is this paper, that Tactical Delusion in Age of Crisis, that you wrote. Uh, you published online. You can read it online. Um, and you write about a clinical case from 2008 of what seems to be the first climate-related delusion um, in Australia, actually, where a 17-year-old who uh, you know, was consuming a lot of information online and then stopped drinking water, believing that millions of people would die because their own share ex would exhaust the global water supply. So that teenager had the urgency to t take very extreme action and um, you know, deprivation, like, ca causing deprivation and destruction to their body. But the body was first a site of inquiry and an access in imaginary. That's what you write in the paper. And I was wondering why you find this case so interesting and how it relates basically to, to the sort of performance you did yesterday um, where you uh, show a very different um, form of affect. Yeah. Yeah, yeah um, I th thank you. Uh, I, I think like in addition, well, I guess maybe let me backtrack a little bit. In addition to that, um, there's, there was a survey published or released a few years ago that asked 16 to 25 year olds um, how worried they were about climate change, and the countries with the highest, highest um, proportion of respondents were the Philippines, India, and Brazil in that order. So initially, um, coming across this clinical case and also the, these studies, you know, the entry point to this research was really an attempt to understand different affects of um, attached to ecological thinking um, or encountering climate change information, and this is, this is obviously somewhat of a wide spectrum uh, which can range from dissonance and despair and anxiety, worry, indifference, denial, you know, all of these, these terms that we always we come across with all the time. But I think this clinical case in particular sort of piqued my interest and curiosities because it highlights not only, uh, not only environmental or eco ecological conditions, but also what the role of media technologies might be uh, in creating a, let's say, network nihilism um, in which value is under the spell of information gluttony or, or synthesis or mediatic interfacing. Um, so I, 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 I sort of wonder how these sort of intersecting um, conditions seep into the body, into, the co into cognition and, and affect. Um, but I think there's urgency. I think the performance yesterday was... It's always sort of fun doing it, like, in a like after a series of lecture performances, and here I am coming in with this type of performance, which is sort of a, li a little bit of a break into you know something that um, is quite very structured. Um, but I think really my I, I I think there's a little bit of urgency to dig deeper 
into what a relational or shared despair might mean. I think what contagion or distribution of dissonance or anxieties are in crisis, though I, I think it's not particularly limited to an ecological crisis, I should say. Um, I think this is, you know, any, anywhere where the contradiction or violence or control are sort of lived, um, rea live their ongoing realities, I think this sort of relates to as well. But I think also categorically, I always sort of get this response from people is that um, this sort of thinking might be described as pessimistic or like nihilistic, um, fatalistic or doomist, but I think that's sort of just scratching the surface. Uh, the work, the actual work here is to really find the potential in dissonance, and I think if there's even a possibility for recalibration. Mm. Yeah, I think for me this, like, this extreme action um, symbolizes something like an effect out of scale, right? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> it's really interesting, and, and I totally share your, your um, interest in effect uh, more generally to um, the media ecologies that produce this kind of feelings. Um, and we talked briefly before the conversation about um, the idea of unfeeling, um, um, because I see it some way, in some way as an opposite movement to what you describe in this extreme action, right? So um, I wanted to briefly read two definitions of, of Asum Pong. One is the, uh, um, because I wanted to see the I wanted to have you see the difference between these definitions. One is from Wikipedia. That's the first one. It says that Sumpong in Filipino psychology refers to a range of short-term or temporary temperaments, mood problems, or illnesses wherein a person withdraws affection or cheerfulness from people in general. That's Wikipedia. And then there is the one from the TM website. I think is yours. No. Um, through particularly nuanced mean meaning uh, in Philippine psychology, Sumpong is defined as a spontaneous but often recurring and unexplainable deviation from the norm as a coping strategy in a hostile environment. So here you see Wikipedia doing the patholog patholo pathologization, excuse me, and then um, you, you've given us a very different um, definition. And I was thinking about a book by Xini Yao. Um, that is called disaffected, but also but what we heard from Tang Wei Yu yesterday about lethargy. Um, so unrecognized, pathologized feelings of racialized and gendered subjects offering disaffection as a strategic, calculated break from affectability. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on that, if that is playing a role for you too. Yes, I, I should also reference um, this anthropological paper that I came across uh, called it's on Sumpong Spirit Beliefs. It's called Sumpong Spirit Beliefs, Murder, and Religious Change Among 18th Century Aita in Elongot in Eastern Central Luzon. So some of the ideas were also sort of inspired by this paper. It's by Mark Dizon, um, not a rel not a relative. We just happen to have the same last name. Um, okay. So, <laughs> but I think to give to give a little bit more context to the word is uh, to the context to Sumpong is that it's it's sort of an affective. Um, response to unknown, uncertain, unintelligible external stimuli. And it's, it's an indirect way of channeling aggression. And it's quite culturally specific to the Philippines with similarities in uh, some Austronesian languages and dialects. But growing up, I always sort of understood uh, Sumpong as a form of sulking um, or moodiness or throwing a temper tantrum. And in psychology, as you mentioned, it can be considered as irrational or an irrational behavior. But culturally, the more gentle, the gentler um, connotation, I guess, for Sumpong is that one is able to feel or express feelings. And also in other contexts, as written in the, in the, in the paper that I had mentioned, um, in, like in animism, Sumpong could be a chance encounter with spirits and signs that might be causing um, illness or devastation um, or acting hostile. Uh, but it could, it could also be a response um, to act on something. So as you can already tell, like, uh, you know, as mentioned, it's like, it's very nuanced in meaning. It sort of like floats in different, um, in different angles and parts of, you know, yeah. So I, I think, I think really the, the a huge interest here is, or at least in sort of creating in this perform this research performance and presenting it is that communicating and articulating the specific, the specificity of feeling is, already quite a challenge, I think, anthropocentrically speaking. Um, and I think 
yeah, I don't know. I think um, sometimes it's even like um, disregarded or, or, or discouraged, I guess, you know? So landing, landing and uh, expanding the notion of Sumpong through more than human perspectives as a racialized and queer person, this is sort of where all it deviates from um, the more linear and traditional uh, definition of, of the word. And I think lethargy, is, lethargy I think, is quite mm. interesting as well. I mean, I, I think the, the panel was today. I may have missed it. Okay. Um, and maybe, what I think I mentioned it before as well, is that I think withdrawal maybe aligns with this in action and, and movement, maybe something as a little bit more actionable. Um, but what is, what is it sort of... I've sort of been asking this question for a couple of years now. Um, and I mean, I'm sorry, I don't have any answer really, but <laughs> I'm just continuing to think, th to think through it. But what is it to withdraw aff effectively first? You know, I always ask that. What, this is also mentioned in your introduction as well, is that what's absence and non-presence um, as resistance and also something that I've um, sort of ex explored in other forms of thinking, like thinking through the desert and all of that stuff. Um, but also like non-presence and forms of ghosts um, and spirits and sort of fleeting, fleeting moments and, uh, and elusiveness. But I think uh, the, the performance yesterday has, um, I should mention that, uh, has elements of an anituan, um, but, well, let me explain what an anituan is actually. So an anituan is, is a curing seance in the Aita community where um, the, a medium or the maga anito sort of goes into a trance-like state uh, and attempts to make contact and have di has dialogue with, uh, with a spirit that might be causing devastation you know, toward the afflicted. Um, and I sort of started to think through maybe the communal and communicative aspects of this, this seance, but I also want to be clear that like Sumpong is not an, an, an anituan by any means. Like it's, it's neither a healing practice nor a meditative repair. Um, I'm not in a position to do that, though while not the intention, people do come up to me and have come up to me in other perfor similar performances where they sort of share um, a change of feeling or an energy, a shift in energy after, um, thus surfacing the, the potential. And I think that's sort of what, um, where sort of like, you know, this could be sort of expanded a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, informed though, I, I, I just want to share this lastly, is that um, Sumpong, the performance is sort of partially in inspired by this faint memory that I have um, many, many years ago of elder relatives calling for the services of a medium, the services, of a, me of a medium to find out why my grandfather was at that time very seriously ill and incapacitated. And I remember, I remember the medium um, going in with a um, sort of a large round bucket, filled, uh, filling it with water. They had, they had a candle, lit the candle, um, pour, was pouring wax on the, onto the surface of the, um, onto the water. Um, while chanting prayers over my grandfather, but eventually um, this wax formed a form of, uh, it, it formed a, sh a shape of a face or a head, which inconclusively or conclusively uh, pointed to a curse, apparently, for, you know, as, as, as mentioned by this, by this medium. But I think what I attached to this memory more vividly was the gathering itself, um, and this was sort of this, uh, this mood that I wanted to create in, in the performance yesterday. And during that time, you know, we lived in um, a very cozy apartment where several people, that was occupied by several people. Um, and somehow, um, the, what, what was tragic for the family somehow became a neighborhood, a neighborhood event. You know, so it became like an event with and for, for the neighbors. Um, but, pe there were people that I wasn't familiar with that went in, um, sort of, you know, kind of engaged with what was happening, people spilling out of the apartment. Um, there were, uh, like, mumblings and whispers, and when the, when, the, uh, when the medium shared that information about the curse, um, you know, there were, like, gasps, like telenovela gasps, soap opera gasps, you know? Um, and then eventually people just started to, you know, 
break and leave and probably just went about their day. So I think like the, the thing that sort of like stood out to me is that in that specific gathering, there was this, even, even temporarily, there was a sharp, very, very sharp, like sort of shared mourning, you know, in that moment. And I think in, in, in an as practice based research, um, the deviation in the concept of Sumpong is to seek a disembodied or maybe a disaffected mm. type of communication that mm. responds not only to immediate conditions, but also to e e emotional proximities um, as maybe a never-ending um, affective process of working with, I don't know, like working with or through like imposed, imposed restraint individually and then maybe somehow collectively. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Great. You're welcome. I, I look forward to talking more about this. Um, Nadim, up to you. Uh, you're an artist living and working in Beirut. Uh, you mainly work with film, sculpture, and your practice focuses on the material histories and futures of innovation. Uh, there's social and political driving forces, and you're also co-program director of the Beirut Art Center. And what I find especially interesting, also a researcher for Haven and Artist, a Haven for Artists, sorry, a cultural feminist arts organization that provides a space for intersections of art and activism. <clears throat> and your research revolves around uh, global environmentalisms and un universalist notions of sustainability, um, their entanglement with colonial thinking, and how they affect land and bodies in the Middle East. So, for instance, um, I've read up on your research where you look at how fertility or fertile lands in the context of the Middle East and those colonial notions of land and milk and land of milk and honey um, have led to this area being constantly greened. Which, actually, which, you know, in the end harms the environment. Um, and you've produced a film that I found really great. Uh, the sky oscillates between eternity and its immediate consequences. Uh, it explores how the future of smart cities relies on the promise of sustainable closed systems in the face of health and ecological crisis. Uh, and it's two protagonists narrating how the control, isolation, exploitation of time, including environmental life cycles, um, seasons and organisms, lifetimes, form the blueprint to achieve such futuristic missions. And we will see a clip from the film. Inside the colony, the closest thing to feeling the sun behind a summer mist is someone else's breath on you. And even then, even then, you recognize the feeling after the breath is gone. of my lover was just shadows at sunset. Or how the movement of light on them is the most important part to realize them. But inside the colony, our skies don't fade. Our suns run for maximum efficiency. We risk the infinity of never becoming shadows, just little specks drowning in full bright blue. Even under closed eyes, the light becomes a reoccurrence, the pulse of an optimal cycle shaping you, just little specks tinkering for a new feeling of light. But my rearrangements never last. The second shift of hand pollinators always placed them back. We began this task when all the hummingbirds fell down and we became their substitute. Bats were an option, but they needed more moths than we can carry. 
So nix the bats, nix the moths, nix the plants that bats would have pollinated. You need to be equal parts functional and replaceable to be here. It's like the phrase, a coincidence in nature, which only works when it works for our benefit. A gear and a machine that finally fits and ticks away. Endlessly running, endlessly rendered. But what if the future is not rendered for you? What if you need to have the most perfect beak to be part of our journey? 20 millimeters to be exact. We played this on every screen till it came to fruition. Designer tails for microbes, making them the fastest motors on Earth in hopes to terraform Earth itself. The promise or irony of bringing life to life. And everyone felt lost when we released them to the outside and the background stayed blue. There is no vividness in happening apart from what is happening around you. It clarifies nothing except chronology. I've heard stories of how all the coffee shops smelt exquisite as they burned in the great fires before the colony. And I can't help but trust the heat on my face is the same on yours, rising from inside out. one's for you. At the end of cities, I found a mutant plant. We have been warned to cut out anything that risks the cycle, but soon is finally a place in time beyond the colony's permission, where uncertainty forms living rather than being part of an investment in certainty. How can I save this plant for you in the future without dictating your present? Given all the permutations that prepositions can achieve, maybe my letter should just list them. Two words, until, behind, beyond, abroad, and beyond the defense of the unexpected, the mutation is you in attendance, not settling for a final shape placed on you. Soon as soon, coming together at the chance of reorganization. Yeah, I'm a back, big fan of that film. <laughs> I watched it four times, I think. Do it too, please. Um, <clears throat> I don't know who has seen like the opening performance of Nadima the first night. There will be a full version tomorrow, and um, which is called The View from Above Takes My Breath Away Fully, uh, 5 p.m. in the club room. Um, and you examine how political determinations and ambitions of the global environmental view identified certain regions as resources to develop them into globally productive lands. That is something that I also see in the film, of course, and I wanted to, you, wanted to ask you to elaborate a bit on how these two works interact. Hello. First of all, thank you for all this. It's great. Beautiful introduction. Um, yeah, I mean, so basically, I'm going to be talking without images just because uh, I did that in the lecture performance, so I'll talk not alongside them, just before them and after them. Um, but the the film that you just saw are excerpts of it. Um, this guy oscillates between eternity and its immediate consequences. Is I mean, it mainly started from how the idea of sustainability as a closed loop 
which is taken as inherently uh, beneficial, um, you know, closed economies, closed recycling, like the perfect kind of loop, zero waste. Um, how is it actually practiced? And I mean, you know, you end up getting these like uh, really f slick um, arrow diagrams, like uh, you need like five plants to produce this much oxygen, you consume X amount of CO2, you know, it eats it back up and both of you will live happily, happily ever after, but only if you like don't breathe that much more. Um, you know, it's uh, so the kind of like the idea to design the perfect um, environmental scheme. Um, and these have been kind of happening in many places uh, around the world. Uh, one of them is called the um, Mars Science City, which is being built in Dubai. So, um, which is, I mean, it's ironic in a sense, the architect in a, in a panel, uh, and this is what the film is based on actually, like a lot of uh, things are based on this specific project where Mars Science City is supposed to be this closed environment that um, will, it's a kind of like a major research center, but also of course will have a mall inside. Um, and it's supposed to teach us how to live on Mars, but also, um, and in their words, it says export climate solutions to the world now. So like also to learn how to live with like upcoming um, climate catastrophes. And yeah, I mean, you know, so the architect, architect actually says like, yeah, we're gonna, you know, take down all the trees that were actually outside that are naturally in the desert and put them inside to make the desert outside look more dead. You know, just to like make this city look like it's the, you know, like the new uh, Garden of Eden in the Dubai desert. And um, so the, the film kind of came out of um, thinking of like, okay, let's see actually, um, they use all these like slick renders, which I mean, I'm also like a big sucker for like slick images, but, and typically these like architectural renders don't have people in them or if they have people in them, they're like either like luxurious, they're like sitting beside the pool or, you know, like they have a perfect family in the, in the you know, space or whatever. And um, for me, I was just like, okay, I mean, I can also produce these slick renders. So like, let me do a test and imagine uh, who can actually live in them. And the protagonist, I mean, I wrote the script very specifically for two friends who uh, in many ways uh, don't, can't navigate the city fully uh, because of either can they pass because of their gender expression or not, or you know, in many ways also political stances. And the script was written for them to also see if their desires can work in this kind of like hyper perfect idealistic city. Um, and the film goes through how these, you know, when the enactment of this like perfect arrow diagrams actually are extremely exploitative and extractative. Um, and um, yeah, I think for me that like using, focusing so much on the desire to base the script, um, instead of like, let's say just feelings is because I think desire can like also give a direction. Uh, I think like desire does have a direction while feelings are that come after desire. And um, the script is written to disrupt the image, right? Like, um, and just to kind of give more context, sorry about the like actual film, it's uh, in like five small vignettes where these two protagonists, uh, you know, talk about their lover, uh, one of them talks about how they can't pick up someone at night, they can't cruise at night in the city because the lights are always on. Um, another talks about um, the perfect microbe being actually sent outside to terraform Earth or give life back to life, um, which is actually from like a, that's a line from a poem by Justin Chin, who, um, wrote about sea monkeys. I don't know if you remember these like toys where you can like crack uh, an egg and not, sorry, you put like a, something in a type of um, tank and you get these like shrimps. Um, and I mean, the way sea monkeys were marketed as well was that you can have, they were called instant life. 
Um, and really, I think these projects try to recreate life, although while life is already around, but they just try to like, you know, uh, use the newness of the renders, use the newness of climate catastrophe um, as well as like something that's perpetually new, like, you know, the word unprecedented, um, uh, to kind of uh, capitalize on actually um, putting more of the environment into a, an abstraction of uh, value, right? Because that makes a lot of the environment up for grabs. And I guess one more thing about the film, then I'll kind of link it to the lecture performance, is that um, really like the thing that is most exploited in these uh, um, projects that are happening in Dubai, the States, China, um, Russia, um, is that the, yeah, Time is like the essence of um, how, you know, actually these renders try to control environmental cycles, life cycles, biological cycles. So really like the, you know, actually being able to capture time is the uh, biggest dream in these, um, in these projects. And for me, the renders kind of capture cer certain sense of time um, because whether these projects do get realized or not, um, and for example, in the lecture performance, you see like this uh, hybrid jellyfish mangrove root creature that is supposedly a mile long. That's another project that's happening or wants to happen uh, that will be treated like a desalination plant. Uh, you know, whether actually, you know, jellyfish are now in the labs trying to be infused with mangrove roots, um, it does dictate the, the faith of present organisms, even if it's just a render. So uh, these models kind of like reverse time in that the future really um, messes with the present before whether the future is reached or not, you know, that this future. Um, yeah, and then I think, I don't know how much time I have, but um, I guess the lecture that I did uh, um, on the first day and tomorrow, uh, I'll do one, um, is about tracing what I, what I think of as the uh, promissory potential of time um, that are used in these environmental uh, projects uh, and tracing it back to when um, uh, that's kind of entered the thinking of environmental uh, projects and environmental scale. Um, and one of the kind of like biggest um, projects I focus on is uh, the Arid Zone Program, which uh, UNESCO started, you know, right after the war uh, in the 1950s. Yeah, in the Second World War. And um, the, for like the goal of uh, ending world hunger, they wanted to turn all the deserts into you know, green, lush, like heaven. Um, and really, because the scale was so big, um, it actually forced them to abstract the environment because they actually can't achieve that result. So it ended up, you know, they had to find these references which were very colonial references of the Middle East, which is like, you know, the granary of Rome, uh, which is actually North Africa, but then you're just like, slap it onto the Middle East. Um, and um, yeah, and then from that type of abstraction of the environment and time to pure value, instead of looking at the present, I kind of make a link to how global environmentalism, which you know used to go through imperial thinking and international development, still contains this like, you know, tinge of imperial thinking, but now enters into biotechnology and um, the exporting of cities as well as environments. Yeah, sorry. If I, yeah. Oh, good. Thanks. Um, I was wondering, um, because it also, it's, I think, would be a nice transition to what Azia is going to tell about. I um, wanted to come back to this idea of lands of milk and honey and <clears throat> how the colonial view of that land renders it at the same time that, as you explained, but also as having infinite potential and 
of course, you say you need metrics to kind of uh, scale and metrics to create infinite potential, right, to suggest it. I was wondering if you could briefly elaborate on that. Um, yeah, um, you know, um, it's, a, yeah, it's like a, the duality of both presenting the land as dead in order to have agency to kind of control it uh, or justify it for yourself, while also saying it could become heaven. Um, and this has, this obviously comes from one, thinking of both the land and the people on it as, let's say, uncivilized or unattached to the land and can't navigate it, and that's why it has become deserts. So it has like this uh, also, you know, sprinkle of uh, like a civilizing mission. Um, and I had a thought that I wanted to say. Um, yeah, and also, um, I'm thinking, sorry. Um, I'm trying to remember what I was following that with. But anyway, um, yeah, it's uh, also the, and then actually, you know, trying to place it as heaven is uh, another sort of abstraction. And the way that they kind of, uh, it's really interesting to see this actually happen, because a big, uh, there's a, I mean, a beautiful book um, called How the um, UN um, Created Spaceship Earth, which really talks about the diplomacy of this type of duality um, in kind of when can you use which language and for what time. Um, and yeah, I think, I think this has, part of the lecture also talks about how that actually gets transferred to uh, kind of like a neo-colonial sense mm -hmm. where um, greening, which, you know, I don't oppose, I, you know, I actually think, you know, we do need to green at some point, uh, but the type of greening uh, that is being kind of exported in a sense is uh, heavily based on the colonial standard of productivity of a land. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really great way to end this answer. Thanks so much. Um, I hope we can have a conversation between the two of you later too. Now first, Asia. <clears throat> Asia will stand up. Um, you're an art historian. Um, whose research spans visual culture, feminist epistemology, and environmental humanities at large. Um, the, pro the projects that you do focus on a hybrid of European and Soviet modernities um, and its ideological and material implications in spaces, bodies, and lands. Um, she co-authored Geocinema, a collaborative project exploring the possibilities of a planetary notion of cinema. Uh, and we're both at the Critical Media Lab and working together, and I'm really happy to hear about your current research uh, on how territories are rendered as resourceful, useful, or wasted suitable for repurposing through colonial expansionist projects of both Western European states and the Russian Empire. And Asya, I would like to ask you to elaborate a bit more on how these colonial imaginaries actualize today, especially in the context of what Timothy Snyder calls uh, the hydrocarbon war. And a which is a militarization of energy regimes that eventually threatened the world's political order. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Okay, good. Uh, I will stand because I have too much energy to share. So thank you, Johannes, for the intro. And I also want to thank the super team of Transmediale, who has been hosting me for the past months and supported me with my transition from Ukraine to Germany. And I also want to thank um, everyone who is currently fighting in Ukraine. My brief contribution today uh, follows multiple conversations that Johannes and I had over the past months in Critical Media Lab and addresses the omnipresence of energy imagination on micro, meso and macro scales. So I'll start with micro. Some weeks ago, I was running towards my gates in Berlin-Brandenburg Airport and its newly built terminals that were put in operation just two years ago were well equipped with electrical sockets and power stations so that all the passengers can keep all their gadgets well charged. I like to have all my gadgets well charged. There are many activities that require energy 
uh, in the suspended time in front of the gate. You can see people finishing work on laptops, downloading gigabytes of TV series for streaming platforms, from streaming platforms, video calls with whoever is there to kill your time, scrolling a never-ending feed on Instagram, reels and stories. Keeping all the gadgets charged at all times makes you feel just normal. I was going to Ukraine, and someone asked if I was, if I was going to fly there. And I rolled my eyes. What is this question? Ukraine is at war. The airports were destroyed within the matter of hours. Moreover, under the martial law, every flying object is a target. Isn't it obvious? So I was annoyed, of course, that the equal access to goods and things was just assumed. So going to Ukraine, you can fly to Poland or Romania or Slovakia, and from there you can proceed by trains to Kyiv. Or you can take multiple trains directly from Berlin through Poland and then to Kyiv, and it's almost like an environmentalist dream, only trains. But last time it took me about 28 hours, and it was not fun at all. As I arrived to Kyiv, and it was winter, war, and I made it to my friend's place, and we were chatting, and they said that they downloaded TV series to watch later. And then I said, don't you have Netflix? And they rolled their eyes and laughed at my question, and they said, well, we do, but we do not have electricity. Since a large percentage of Ukraine's energy infrastructure was deliberately destroyed by Russian missiles, the life of Ukrainian people was heavily affected. While it is easy to count immediate victims of Russian missile attacks, there will be no number to those who suffered consequences of power outages whether they died of cold, or their health conditions could not be sustained, or whatever else affected them in the long term this very dark winter. In Kyiv, what you can and cannot do is defined by the timeline of blackouts. The power is off, ten minutes later you, your mobile connection is also not working, so you cannot rearrange the plans if you had plans, you cannot notify people, neither they can notify you, you cannot quickly check the route on Google Maps, you may or may not be able to call a cab, for the hours to come, you'll have to think about energy. The blackout turns you into a nomadic body. It forces you to redefine your relationship with space and time. Mezzo. In science and technology studies, socio-technical imaginaries understood as collectively imagined forms of social life and social order that is reflected in the design and fulfillment of nation-specific and or technological projects. Sustainable development would be an apt example of such an imaginary. And there is, of course, ever-expanding scholarship that articulates that the imagination of sustainability creates its own constitutive outside, where caring for the environment and sustainable lifestyle here is bought um, at the extraordinary high price of producing unsustainability elsewhere. Political geographer Eric Sungedouf writes that the frantic search for new advanced solutions to better manage a supposedly sustainable future often serve to deepen commodification of both human and non-human matter. In my recent work, I wanted to further explore the socio-technical imaginaries with regards to those elsewhere, such as Ukraine. I was particularly interested in the widespread imagery of Ukraine as the breadbasket, a land of infinitely fertile black soil, rich with minerals, a land that could easily feed the whole world, an inexhaustible resource that is unconditionally given by nature. This breadbasket image evolved through the parallel processes of geological prospecting and territorial imagination. And this image is a product of the hybrid of European and Soviet modernities, each of which in its own way mapped and imaged the territories that are present-day Ukraine. Imaging and imagination, coming both from Western Europe and the Russian Empire, enabled the production of territory through, through the process of resourcification that sees Ukraine, its territory, natural resources and people as an operational space, merely aside for material transactions. Such presumed automatic inclusion of territories, their soils, minerals and, and their populations in material transactions between colonial powers has contributed to the emergence of regimes of material power that prevail today through constant reinvention. The Russian war on Ukraine is part and parcel of the imperial and therefore colonial view of Ukraine as a resource. Sociologist and philosopher Raymond Aron wrote that geopolitics combines a geographical schematization of diplomatic strategic relations 
with a geographic economic analysis of resources. Europe's increased dependency on Russian oil and gas is driven by economic advantages, yet it is folded into the mix of generally advanced yet very uncritical environmental concerns. Much of Europe's economy benefited from speculations on green energy futures that allowed for extractivist practices elsewhere. Ukraine, in this case, is a territory for extraction. It is also an interface for pack transactions between East and West. It is a buffer zone that takes all the bullets in while continuously giving grain that is saf safely escorted out of the country through specifically negotiated corridors. Now that the world had no necessary means to stop the war in a matter of weeks, days or hours, the status of Ukraine as a buffer zone is crucial in order to sustain the material state of various states and other actors. Following Catherine Yusuf, I repeat that the category of inhuman is created at the moment of material transaction. Macro. Here in Germany, en energy and climate are two central themes in media politics, on artistic platforms and in mundane conversations. Again, uh, curious as to how these socio-technical imaginaries are being inscribed into the fabrics of every day. Since I relocated here a few months ago, I've been taking pictures of front pages of newspapers, regularly concerned with potential seasonal inconvenience, inconveniences for consumers of energy in Germany. I was paying attention to brochures that were popping up in my mailbox, explaining the green energy futures in a very detail. Political statements from left to right, debating whether to launch Nord Stream 2 or not, and the street statements of which uh, this one on the screen that says this is not our war has been the most popular so far and the most traumatizing for the people displaced by the war. Feelings aside, I was wondering how war, even if a matter of concern, is still not so much a part of an energy climate discursive scenario. As information theorist Svetlana Matvienko writes, there are at least two vectors along which this war unfolds. The inter-imperial one, which operates through the Terrans to allow for communication. And then the next one is colonial imperial one, which operates through terror and excludes communication. The logic of the Terrans, pushing, escalation, nuclear blackmail, all techniques inherited from the Cold War dynamics. The Terrans is a type of negotiation, Whatever happens between imperial powers, they will eventually negotiate. They want things to settle down and the gas to flow. The colonial imperial logic of terror is what Russia is doing to Ukraine. And in Russia's eyes, Ukraine has no right to exist and therefore it cannot be a part of negotiations. Genocide is production of terror, killing, humiliation, deterioration, pollution, torture, Crucial is that the information about terror becomes content and is spread through various networks. These two dimensions, according to Matvienko, create the complexity of the war. For the success of negotiations between the imperial power, powers, terror has to be done successfully too. The imagery surrounding energy security and the need to battle climate change is distanced from the war that is seemingly not part of the imagination. The notion of territory as a resource justifies a spatial organization that enables slow violence and environmental damage through the category of inhuman. This process equates the human population and life at large to geological, agricultural and other forms of matter with usable material capacities. Over the past decades, Russian Federation terrorized people of Chechnya, Moldova, Georgia, Syria and Ukraine while weapons were flowing to Russia from major manufacturers in Western Europe in exchange for fossil fuels. Every attempt of local resistance, resistances in plural, were largely downplayed here through reiteration on infantilizing colonial tropes. Even now, when the scale of Ukraine's resistance, courage and solidarity is unprecedented in recent history, the people of Ukraine and its resources are discussed primarily through the lens of priorities, energy, climate security, as seen from here. There is a growing yet still marginal conversation about the depoliticizing aspect of the Anthropocene rhetoric that offstages political possibilities. One lines of critique, also by Eric Sungedouf, follows Roberto Esposito's analysis of biopolitical governmentability 
no, governmentality, sorry, that is driven by the immunological drive. There is a mission to seal off objects of government, the population, from possibly harmful intruders or destabilizing outsiders, such as CO2, waste, bacteria, refugees, viruses, ozone, financial crisis, climate change, that threaten the bio-happiness, if not survival, of the population. The sealing off guarantees that the life can continue to be lived just as it was lived before. I think I should stop here. Up to you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we can elaborate through the questions. Yeah. Yeah, thank so you so much. much. Thanks so much, Asya. <clears throat> What I uh, really also found powerful in your argument um, uh, when you talked about the double imperialism um, that kind of, you know, crashes into Ukraine. Um, it's something that I want to elaborate on with you. And also wanted to talk to you about something that happened also <coughs> elsewhere, of course, like um, the process of infantilization. Mm -hmm. We know this from the IM, uh, IMF actions in Southeast Asia earlier. Um, it's happening now to, to Ukraine. Um, in the article you published in Iflux, the No Milk, No Love, um, you quote the German ambassador in Kiev, Anka Feldhusen, who, when asked about Ukraine's fears of Russian invasion a few years ago, responded that the German government respected Ukraine's struggle for self-determination, but that Germany's economic ties with Russia were paramount, and that changed rather quickly. <laughs> uh, when it was finally recognized that the completion of the pipeline would pose a serious threat to Ukraine, uh, Feldhusen changed her tune and suggested that Ukraine can do much better than serving as a mere transit country for Russian gas. It can, for example, become a hub for the development of alternative energy. Uh, and I, th I think you see these dynamics of double imperialism at play here in a really nice way. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on the significance of infantilizing tropes in this current situation. Yeah, I mean, I think there's many ways uh, or many entry points to this conversation. Because I guess, I mean, since you mentioned the, the dual colonization or how I call it in, in the article, because we see, of course, like if from the Russian side there's an act of killing and the um, kind of from, from the side of Europe, or Western Europe, it's also like what was mentioned as deterrence, this kind of like uh, explaining why this or that solution would be better and then kind of like... Um, uh, as some of the politicians here say, like making efforts that the conflict does not spread further than the Ukrainian territory. And then, of course, I, I guess it's seen through this um, kind of uh, debates and the knowledge production about the country and kind of reiteration of this um, kind of idea of, of, of Ukraine as resource that is that we can see again if we talk about socio-technical imaginaries uh, and, and energy. Uh, in the projects that are being proposed, right? Uh, for example, if earlier uh, kind of Ukraine was a transit country and then when the, the pipeline was ready, the rhetoric was that, oh, maybe you can be the platform for new forms of energy. We can harvest solar panel because, you know, the hotter the climate, the more sun uh, there is in Ukraine. So it's also can be nicely used and uh, you can build your economy on that. Now when uh, much of the country or like a, a, a big... Um, part of energy infrastructures in Ukraine is destroyed, the conversation is like maybe we can uh, think of um, kind of uh, hydrogen production, something we discussed earlier. So there's always this kind of uh, uh, speculations of what can be done that somehow are prioritized or that, that, that precede uh, a, a conversation about um, uh, actually people, you know, and, and type of uh, resistances also that are happening in Ukraine. And speaking of the um, uh, infantilization tropes, of course, they come from this kind of um, uh, never-ending planetary-scale gaslighting that often done, done to uh, people that are constantly fighting for their survival. Um, and again, I mean, this war lasts for a very long period of time, and it's not that kind of... There were no people in Ukraine who would talk about it, but this kind of opinion is also always downplayed. And kind of even now when this war is actually happening and people want to talk about it, there's always and whenever like someone starts talking to me here, they would be like, yeah, but 
you know, and then they kind of explain that, you know, but maybe, you create, you, like maybe, maybe Ukrainians are too nationalist, or maybe you're too this, and maybe you're too that, and somehow, or maybe your tone is right, not, not, not really right, or maybe there's some energy is wrong about this conversation, or maybe you just, you need to consider your partners differently, and there's always this kind of talking at people who actually try to resist the imperial force. So there are many ways uh, how it plays out, but I think we'll just keep it short. Yeah. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm wondering if I should ask another question, or does the audience have questions right now? Let's ask audience. I don't see anyone, but please um, raise your hand and, and let me know if there's something coming up. I wanted to ask you then um, if you could elaborate a bit on a specific projects, because I think they're not necessarily in public consciousness, like um, um, a solar power plant in Chernobyl, the transformation mm -hmm. of uh, wasted land yeah. into, you know, future potential. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah because, I mean, it con uh, follows the previous um, um, question as well. I mean, a very specific case that we um, uh, discussed earlier, too, is that... Um, uh, implementation of a new project between Germany and, and uh, a Ukrainian company in Chernobyl and I was also following the rhetoric and you know that Chernobyl is an exclusion zone and for many years also in, in public imagination is this horrible place that contains all fears and uh, catastrophic uh, legacies and then suddenly this rhetoric changes a, f a few years ago where uh, uh, the conversation goes as follows, like, yes, this was wasted land, but now it can be repurposed because we can install solar panels, and then the whole green energy rhetoric is being uh, kind of weaved into this. And uh, I mean, this also, like lots of this rhetoric also defines uh, development of other projects. And uh, maybe I should add something about the resourcification because I mentioned it a few times. Uh, and. Um, I think for me, like this kind of projects or this kind of focus helps to also in a way kind of um, propose something uh, or like find a productive framework to talk about things related to Ukraine because I think with post-colonial theory, we have all this conversation about the subaltern and the, the, the knowledge production about the colonized subject and how the colonized subject speaks. But then also now maybe I also see um, kind of limits with, with post-colonial theory because as the quote that you mentioned before, for example, Germany, or like German ambassador can say, yeah, we recognize that you are like people or like separate people, but then the, the, the actual implementation of colonial scenarios happens through infrastructures. And I guess this is also for me was a productive way to talk about this uh, kind of legacies of colonialism, but through a different language, the language of material transactions. Uh, yeah. Hmm. I think that also kind of nicely ties in with the planetary, planetary portals um, presentation yesterday, where you see actually the, co the continuities, because there was also the talk about yeah recognizing the people as a different, as different, but then at the same time um, really um, attempting to prevent them from developing their own identity. Um, I mean, I, I'm not a huge fan of identity talk at all, like because also. Um, yeah, I mean, it's also kind of, you know, when uh, lots of people or like the criticism that is like, oh, yeah, maybe you are in Ukraine are uh, too nationalist. And it's not that kind of, it's not that people in Ukraine are too nationalist, it's that there's an active struggle for survival, you know, and it's not for identity as such, it's like for survival. And then to understand that in the broader scale, uh, it's, I guess, I mean, I mean, for me, it's, it's not a struggle for my identity. It's for things that are presumed, presumed as kind of uh, given here, you know, like being a human, choosing a place, like, you know, mobility, uh, access, all these things. And then uh, somewhere else, it's always linked to a particular territory. And for example, yesterday in the stock that you just mentioned, there was this, I don't remember exactly how, uh, 
it was said, but there was something that the kind of the imagination of a colonized subject is always kind of limited and linked to that territory because this is where you are, you probably couldn't move, you, you had to fight for that place, and then eventually like you're still being put in that box and then you resist and you want to like have better rights and access as a human, but then you're told that you're probably you're a nationalist and then it kind of never ends this uh, um, uh, in uneven positions never end. They just kind of reinscribe themselves through mm -hmm. different rhetorics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. There is a question over here, I think. And also, please, like panelists, feel free to ask something as well. I've talked enough. <laughs> Thank you so much for this talk. It's, uh, it, it raised the level of emotions, I think, as well. So, um, and I think that's important. Um, and I wanted to, I'm, I'm glad that Asia brought up Anthropocene analysis, uh, even though it's kind of an old discussion here in Berlin where Hakabe has been dealing with that framing of pro the problem for like more than 10 years now. I think it's interesting to revisit in terms of the, uh, now it's being called the planetary crisis. Um, and it, it raises um, the issue where there's a, there's a, there's a false narrative in the, in the Anthropocene as it's been discussed that there is, um, like we humans are creating this climate catastrophe. And then just recently I came across a book from uh, Romain Feli who wrote uh, for Verso uh, a book called uh, The Great Adaptation. And he tries to explain that since uh, the global, sort of during the globalization uh, movements that, that uh, try to make this short, that uh, they weren't trying to solve the, the climate catastrophes. They tried to look for ways to adapt humans and human society to the capitalist industri industrial uh, sort of situation. And when we talk about Ukraine, I, you can kind of see it now as like between imperial forces, uh, a kind of sacrificial zone in order to maintain the high-tech industrialist cultures that are feeding off of these places that can provide the resources to keep this kind of unsustainable culture going across the planet. So. Anthropocene is really interesting to try to revisit in this conversation, and I wanted to put that as a question to you all, and I'm trying to frame it as, um, uh, do you see this as a, as a way to look at it and try to extract ourselves from this industrialist uh, hyper-capitalism that is fueling these wars uh, to maintain itself? Not even. Um, am I on? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I. For me, it's. Uh, I don't avoid that word, but um, I end up, you know, just working on a particular context that then, by default, becomes. I mean, th I mean, also the the uh, the risk of that word is. I mean, what uh, Asya also said is that um, it can kind of erase the person on the land sometimes. Like if we just look at the Anthropocene, like the crisis of the world, um, I think there's um, really particular examples of how imperial colonial thinking uh, connected to environmental crises, whether inflicted by nature or man, are there and you know, Gaza is one of them. Uh, there's also very other particular places and just focusing on the particularity for me kind of uh, without you know tech always bringing up the Anthropocene as a word because its scale can sometimes um, abstract but then for me and I'm, I mean I love abstraction sometimes but uh, it's about actually like trying to link certain particular moments of how it's enacted um, and how, what are the effects? And I think that's like the kind of tricky part of 
actually the Anthropocene that hasn't been done is linking really particular contexts to kind of understand what's next. Like how can we progress with this conversation forward? Like the planetary, okay. But like where, where does it lead us uh, besides just talking of the planetary as a scale, but like the particular points in it? I don't know. Yeah. No, I'm, thank you. I'll, I'll also add something. Because I think it also it is important to understand when we say something like, yeah, Ukraine is a, uh, this land between two powers, a land of sacrifice, we need to also understand where this comment comes from. Like, I can say that, <laughs> you know, but when it's uh, um, kind of said from a position that constantly says, you know, like, yeah, but, you know, Ukraine is just a territory, like it has no subjectivity, which is not true, you know, and Ukraine has been resisting it for years and then like more recently since 2013 and so there's there's also this kind of movement because some people use this argument yeah like but what about nato or america and whatnot but before all that there was a massive protest movement against corruption for like different types of kind of human rights and, and whatnot and it has been there but this infantilizing comes also from like completely not seeing it from here and then when it comes to like those people who were working for decades towards making ukraine into something better nicer and so on but then it was not seen and now these people have to fight in the war and they have to die and then even that is not recognized and it's like yeah but ukraine is this uh, territory so i think it's problematic and also i think that before Maybe I'll skip that, but also to add on the Anthropocene, of course. And I guess this is also a very interesting point, because of course we can say that, oh, you know, but this conversation uh, is kind of dated, yes and not, because I'm interested in how, like, on a, on a scale of popular imagination, right, what conversations are happening. And if you follow, like, what, or like, for example, here in Germany, there's so much conversation about climate, right? And then, like, a person told me <laughs> recently, like, uh, oh, yeah, humans are so bad, they did to, like, the Earth, all these bad things, maybe humanity should just die, and I say, you know, I come from a place where, like, people die every day, and some of them are my friends, and it's not fun, like, this kind of speculation is just really also, like, what is this about? And if we speak about dated and advanced conversations, for example, like, with uh, post-humanism and all the other very advanced uh, and, or like, I don't know, you name it, uh, discourses, they also come from kind of this post-war uh, disillusion or like, you know, humanity, this bad thing, and so then let's talk about f something that is more than human or anti-human or uh, you name it, you know, but then the, the, the difference is that in some places people still fight for basic right to be human, for basic right to live. And these advanced conversations, I don't know if they're actually helping, uh, or like, I don't know if we can say that, you know, like, humanist conversation is already dated because it is actually not, and we have to face it too, yeah. Would you like to respond or? Um, maybe just more generally. I think, you know, I sort of, uh, Maybe instead of like centering on this, the anthropocentric discourse, as also as Asya said, it's something you know that doesn't necessarily need to be dated. Um, I think, yeah, because I think also what you said is that it sort of depends on the different context and different conditions of different people. But I'm sort of taken to, um, I think maybe you mentioned Catherine Jones earlier with scaleless epistemology, and I sort of kind of land on that instead of the the anthropocene, anthropocene discourse where we're thinking about, if, if it's called the planetary crisis now, I sort of think of the different scales and how it's all sort of really related and relevant in proximity to, to different things. So like, um, you know, instead of thinking of it as something that's humanist, maybe I think of it as something as, as local, which might be, you know, um, attached to being human, but I think, uh, yeah. Thanks. Any more questions from the audience? I wasn't saying it, it's it, it's it's an important conversation, but I uh, the the Anthropocene framing, but because 
it created something inaccurate in its depiction of saying that we humans have caused that problem. The problem has been yeah. created by fossil fuels industries uh, and the, the elites who profit from this destruction of the planet. So what I'm trying to push for is like a, a global solidarity and international movement where of course we are in solidarity with the people of Ukraine. And we have to fight these forces that are bringing wars to multiple countries for, for in, in the attempts to maintain something that is unsustainable. And so we should be fighting back against that. No, absolutely. Also, it's a, I guess also something that maybe I didn't articulate clearly because the, the struggle is also that um, there are all this, all the social technical imaginaries that operate on the scale of like particular states, you know, that kind of articulate that, okay, we need uh, energy security. And I was following, for example, I told you how this before, like I was like listening to like videos from the Green Party and from IFD, for example, you know, and I mean, uh, IFD would say we need to launch Nord Stream 2, um, the Green Party would say we need sustainable energy, but then, you know, this kind of sustainable energy will still come probably from, I don't know, solar panels in Ukraine. So there's always this kind of tension between this idea that, okay, like there's the humans everywhere on Earth and somehow they all, all have right to be counted as such. And then there is this lower scale, and I like also this kind of scale as epistemology is a really uh, working method like we, we, when we can actually see where the tensions are because then it comes to kind of a smaller scale or like to the scale of the state and then uh, people would say yeah yeah but you know and then every newspaper every second newspaper in Germany is like is it going to be cold in winter like how are we gonna deal it you know with, with it you know and which I understand why and of course people concerned but then there is this kind of the, um, I don't know, this, this reverse, uh, for example, um, I'm in a reading group uh, which combines uh, environment and psychoanalysis. So we talk about lots about like trauma, feelings, climate change, and like most of the people in this group are professors from, from the United States. And, and whenever we talk, and it's always amazingly productive conversations, but we constantly see that there's like these two universes people who are afraid that they will lose something and they are, they, are, they are scared to lose it. And then people who lost everything and they've seen the, the, the worst of things. And these rivers just do not meet. It's kind of different affects, different concerns, different uh, mobilized or not mobilized actions. And I don't know what to do with that. I don't have answer. Mm. I think also partly related to energy being uh, like most of the time when it's unconscious, it's pure potential. And then it's also at the same time constructed always as a deficit because there's never enough potential for development going forward. The Thank clock here turned yellow and it's going to turn red in a second. We have two minutes. So uh, <laughs> quick question, anyone? Good. Thanks for coming. Or does someone have a closing <laughs> statement? <laughs> um. No closing statement. No closing <laughs> statement. <clears throat> Everything is Okay, then bad. we will just <clears throat> sit here lethargically and let the red clock tick down. And you can, you feel free to leave and we just fade out. Yeah. And maybe, maybe it can get dark here on stage. We are paid for two more minutes, so we'll sit here. <laughs> <laughs> You're free to go. <laughs> Thank you, Thank everyone, you. for coming. Thank Thanks for...